You guys ready? Awesome. So we have Sarah. She is an author, a wellness influencer, and she is also a life coach. We have Amanda. She is the co-founder of Reset Miami. They do a lot of really amazing mindful events, and she is a certified yoga teacher. We have Hugh Get, the colorful Hugh Get. I love her. <laughs> she is the CEO and founder of Dysfunction Magazine and a life and business coach. And we have Sabra. She is the owner of Mana Life Food. If you guys haven't been to it, it's also in downtown Miami. Super good. Uh, and she's also a plant-based nutrition coach. So join me to give a round of applause for these amazing women. So ladies, um, maybe dive a little deeper into your story and how you came to, you know, be in these roles that you have as influencers, as women of wellness, of being such badass bosses? <laughs> Whoever I'll, wants to start. Sure, yeah. I will start it out. And, and stumbled upon is a nice way to put it because it's really, it's like fell really, really hard. Um, took, took, like yourself, Marion, it was a downhill path of alcoholism, of eating disorders, of cancer, of a divorce, until I ended up here in Miami. Um, and Miami along the seems way to be too, the spot, right? <laughs> I, you know, Miami and Vegas get bad raps, you know? We got lovely, wonderful things here that are super healthy. But it was a self-discovery path, and it was really learning who I am as myself. A lot of it I thank to yoga for self-awareness, self-discovery. Uh, I'm also a yoga teacher, former teacher myself. Uh, but it was really... The, the drive and how you talk about wanting to thrive. So being a 15-year cancer survivor today, I felt a lot of that same thing where I was, I was surviving and I was surviving getting past something. I was surviving getting past an eating disorder. And it was, it just got, and it was like, I wanna choose, I wanna choose this life. And I'm gonna wake up every day and I wanna love what I'm doing. And that's where it started to change a lot in my daily and moment choices from like, I have a choice in each and every one of these moments. Mm -hmm. So now it's creating those moments leading up to days, those days leading up to months and so on and so on to create more of a lifestyle. So stumbling, but then creating what I want yeah. and really getting very Conscious selective. Creating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, my story, I'm from Utah and I come from a very large family. I'm one of nine children, so a family of 11. And growing up, there was a lot of love in my household, but like wellness and a nutritional and physical level wasn't something that, that I really had information on. And it, I started working in the modeling industry and started kind of hearing about this wellness, but to me, what I was learning there was still very shallow and it felt very empty and like weight-based. And I was looking for something a little deeper, but that industry did lead me to Miami. And for me, I know people, some people don't think of Miami as like the healthiest place in the world, but for me, I saw crazy exotic fruits that I'd never seen in my life before, and people rollerblading on the beach, everybody looking so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to live here, and in 2012, I made the jump to like permanently move here. And I started going back to school. I started working at Hugo Fresh, which kind of introduced me to nutrition. And my interest in nutrition led me to an interest in yoga. I started teaching yoga. I did that through college for adults and children. And then eventually uh, that led me to Reset, which is what I'm doing now. Hi, everybody. Um, I think for me, the journey um, into wellness started from the inside out. Um, it wasn't so much what I put in my body or what I put uh, you know, like in my temple, but it really stemmed from a place of not understanding my identity. So growing up with a single mom, never having a father around, never really understanding what a proper male figure should look like, um, led me to have a very misconstrued idea of what relationships look like, uh, which also led me down the path of a divorce at 24 years old and really having a huge identity crisis. And so I think contrary to a lot of the ladies that are here, I was actually born in Miami and I did not think it was sexy. Um, <laughs> just gonna say, uh, I was trying to find a way to get out and uh, marriage actually provided that for me. So I ended up moving to Hawaii, which uh, I thought was my paradise and it truly was. However, I felt like I never understood what being alone really was. And so I realized that I was feeling a lot of isolation, but truly that was what led me to understanding and valuing solitude. 
And so solitude is a really beautiful um, and special thing because it led me to spirituality. And uh, that's what I call the seed of my wellness. And so understanding that God was all I had to understand God was all I needed. And so that was what led me down my path. And understanding that I also had a mission to allow other women to understand and value who they are, how they were created, and the reason for which they live. And so for me, my fascination was always art and culture, and particularly magazines. I went to school for everything in the book, went to school for I don't even know how many years, and every time I was studying, I would take study breaks. If most of you guys remember Borders bookstores, you know, any of you oh, old yeah. school, you know what's up. Um, so the Borders, I would go to the magazine section and eat those magazines up and, you know, just look through all the pages and become obsessed with everything. I saw and feel so many different emotions, but at the same time felt like none of those magazines really made me feel like I was enough. Like I had everything in me. It was either look like that girl, dress like that girl, how to please your man in bed, how to do all these things. And I was like, none of that makes me feel like I'm already enough. Where is there one media platform that teaches me and shows me that I already have everything that I need to create the impact that I want in life? And so that's where the whole idea started. The, the wheel started turning and the idea and the seed for Dysfunction Magazine started, which is now an entire movement that started in print pages, so. <laughs> Who loves Dysfunction? Give it up, give it up, give it up. So I just wanna thank Marion, first of all, because it's because of um, friendships and colleagues like this that we have a, a platform to be together in community. And especially I see a lot of women and I feel that we're in an era now where we wanna support each other. It's not about what she does, what do I do? No, it's about like, let's make this happen together because we know we're gonna advance more. So um, my encounter with wellness started when I was probably 14 years old. I started reading my father's journals uh, of Indian Tibet. Started really tapping in big time into Buddhism and what spirituality meant through his eyes, through his connection. My father's my best friend, so um, it was very deep, profound uh, experience from a young age. And I always like, when am I going to go to India? When am I going to see all this magic? And and I started reading books of Lob Sam Rampa. Anybody here knows Lob Sam Rampa? All right, he's uh, he was a channel and um, he channeled a lot of uh, very esoteric things. And I was like, this is crazy. We're made of all this incredible things that are just not like body, you know, we have so many layers. And um, I went into uh, my school library one day and I was researching and I opened a book and I saw the sign of Om, And I read what it meant and it just like, at a, at a core level, like in my solar plexus, I'm like, this is what it is. This is about, you know, we are a microcosm within this macrocosm of what the universe is, of what creation is. You know, what is this infinite sound of creation? I was born in a family which was half Jewish, half Christian. Um, it wasn't religious, but spirituality was always like the norm. So we respected both, but it, I never really had like guidance on like what was what. Um, so I kind of had to discover it on my own with very supportive uh, parents, thank God. And um, since a very young age, I really started to tap into it. And at 19, I studied nutrition in Canada. Uh, I left Colombia where I finished my high school. And after I studied nutrition, I'm like, but, but it's not enough. Like there's, there's other like healing modalities. I've always been uh, super eager about a preventative medicine. You know, what can we do to prevent illness instead of remedial, which is what happens in our society nowadays. We're not thinking about how can we cure and live long healthy. We're always thinking about a quick solution. And really when we want to live in balance and holistically, we need to incorporate other mind body wellness practices. So I went deep into alternative medicines, Reiki meditation, uh, spiritual healing, aromatherapy, and I, I studied all of them and it was like, wow, we have all of these things nature gives us, things that we can give ourselves through practices. And then I'm like, okay, this is all great, but now I need to know the business part of it. Like, how do I put this all together and present it to like somebody? And I went into studying uh, international spa management and development. And I studied in Canada, that too. And then I went and carried my career all over the world, developing wellness projects for spas, uh, training teams, and it's it's always been like my calling. I, I remember at eight, like wanting to be a doctor, but I knew that it wasn't, I didn't know at that age, it wasn't the doctor that we have nowadays. It was the doctor who helps from the beginning, who helps us with the preventative medicine. So now that I think about it, and then after I studied that, I moved to Miami um, from Spain, from Barcelona. In Barcelona, my last project was opening up the W Hotel as director of wellness and spa. And I came here and I became a vegan and raw food chef with Mark Reinfeld. I didn't do it because I, I, 
I did it because I wanted to learn how to cook. I never had a passion for food. And I'm like, I can't be. I quit meat like at 20. Why is it that I have no connection? And I realized it was because my mother never taught me. Never did I once cut an apple with her, a piece of banana bread, nothing, never. So I'm like, I never had a role model in my life to show me that. So I'm like, no wonder. Like, there's like the whole of an, uh, like olive oil and a, you know, tomato in my fridge. So I was like, no, I need to, I need to understand what food is how to prepare it for myself and for my family. And that's when I started to get very deep into specifically plant-based nutrition. Um, and I created my project. It opened almost three years ago. It was a project of love and passion, and it still is. And um, my mission is uh, to educate, obviously, and open an avenue for everybody to understand what plant-based nourishment is without forcing anybody into it. So right now, um, I'm working on a large platform to see and to be able to give these um, information to people on a larger scale because it's um, very hard to do it at MANA just with every client and everybody has so many questions and wants to know, wants to learn. So that's a little bit about how I started with wellness. So. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I told you, it's a, a panel of powerhouse women, you know, doing such amazing things. And maybe you can show, you were talking about uh, rituals. There's a lot of, you know, you talked about choices. Uh, what choices do you make each day? What are parts of your daily rituals or practices that really keep you grounded? You know, with so many things happening, you have work and, you know, environment or whatever it is. Like how, you know, what do you practice? Me? Yeah, any. Oh. Feel free, anyone to share what they're... I definitely have a, a daily ritual. Okay. So um, every single day, I mean, every single day. I know people are like, are you sure every single I'm like, every single day. Uh, it started with like a 10 minute thing because I'm definitely a little bit ADD. So I, I work from home and I've worked from home for several years now. And the idea of working in my pajamas just doesn't really work for me. And so I just feel like if, I, if I'm at home, I'm just gonna fall asleep and take seven naps throughout the day. So my routine started with having to get out of the house, honestly. Um, and so in order for me to get dressed for the day, I had to, go somewhere and so that for me became going and having a little bit of like spiritual reading time now at the time as i said i was going through this really interesting journey of finding my solitude however because i come from a place like miami that's so fast-paced my solitude actually happened in a fast-paced environment so i needed to feel the energy of other people and for me that actually ended up being starbucks so a coffee shop. I hope nobody hates me here. Starbucks is a great company. Um, <laughs> they do a lot of great things for people. Um, but for me, that actually ended up being Starbucks. And so I was like, well, I could sit here. This, I don't even drink coffee, but like the smell of coffee just really excites me. And I would just sit there and feel the energy of people. I'd put on my little headphones and just put on some soothing music and was instantly able to connect. And I was like, okay, well, I can't, I can't really read, you know, this like spiritual scripture. I don't get it. I don't understand all this like gibberish. So I would just start journaling and I would start writing love letters to God. And that's how my spiritual time started. Now I have a, a daily ritual that's about an hour to an hour and a half. I know that sounds really crazy, um, but I wake up at whatever time I need to, to have that time because that sets my mind and my heart in the place that it needs to be. And it also just allows me to charge my heart and calibrate everything to where I understand what my calling is that day. Because I understand like what my vision is in general and, and the types of things that I want to accomplish or what my to-do lists are. But I think that sometimes uh, like that resetting in the moment allows me to set some margin spiritually to be open and aware to something that might need my tending to that not, might not necessarily be in my fast fast paced to-do list. So, uh, so that's my morning ritual every single day. Any other morning rituals? Um, it's definitely not an hour and a half, but I think that I think that the way that you start your morning is very important because that's how you, you, you know you're setting an intention to like spend the rest of your day. And I find it helps me to leave like a large glass of water on the side of my bedside table so that the first choice I make in the morning is to drink you know a full glass of water. And then I personally really need that transition time and it's, it's only like 15 minutes of meditation and sometimes my mind's just going crazy first thing in the morning and I'll channel like a, a gratitude practice. But I think the way you start your morning and starting your morning with intention goes a very, very long way. Along the lines of meditation, and I know it gets like, I wake up and I meditate. I think that there's a, and I do too. 
And I do too. There's a stigma about what meditation is, and it doesn't have to just be closing your eyes and looking as peaceful as possible because that shit doesn't happen, right? It's like your mind goes off and you start thinking about what you have to do for the day. So I tune into different um, videos actually on YouTube that are motivational videos, and it's fueling me with positive thoughts that I want for the day ahead. So I kind of choose, see what my day is ahead because my days change day to day, whether I'm doing coaching or if I'm doing production or if I'm doing something fitness related, it changes every single day. So I need a different fuel for other days. So knowing what you have for the day ahead and plan for that, my meditation is more so going to fuel that. If it pumps me up, if it gives me a, you can do this kind of message or if it's don't quit, um, but always kind of pushing towards the goal that I have for the day ahead. And I drink water and I love coffee, so. <laughs> we'll, go to, we'll go to Starbucks together, girl. Please. There's one opening over here. <laughs> Beautiful. So what about like the things that, what are some of the things that you eat? You know, uh, do you have a type of like diet, lifestyle, you know, wellness? There's, there's so much like controversy. People always think you have to eat this or that. I always believe like you have to tune into what intuitively works for you. What, you know, what works for you ladies? That's, that's an obvious, Come on. right? Okay, I do own a, a vegan restaurant, and um, but I'm I'm very respectful about the the fact that I open mine as a wellness project. This is not a project about uh, converting people or about uh, the idea is to be able to walk with our guests and my clients and the people that I coach hand by hand, step by step, because wellness is not about doing things quick it's about a lifestyle and it really and I know it's like oh yeah we've all heard it and said it but truly truly it is because it's the everyday practices that we do so my diet is plant-based there is a way to be able to have a plant-based diet that's balanced that's uh, good for you I quit meat in the year 2000 so and I didn't know the word vegan didn't exist for me or organic or any of that I had studied nutrition but I just felt that at an intuitive level that I didn't need the meat. So I'm like, well, if I don't need it and I'm not craving it, what do I have in my diet? You know, I knew that they were filling these animals with all these medicines and stuff. Superfoods are a huge part of my diet and uh, tonics and medicinal mushrooms. I do think that um, more and more of us are becoming aware of eating plant-based, regardless of your food habits, if you eat meat or what if you don't. But I think it's now very common for all of us to know that eating a plant-based diet is an anti-aging diet prevents disease, makes us feel better. And anybody in here plant-based? Any? All right, cool, awesome, yeah. Uh, anybody transitioning to plant-based? Ah, that's very important. So you see what I mean? So that's that's another thing, which is like a lot of us might be having X, X diet and want to get here, and it's about these daily choices that we make. So if you guys want to know more about what I eat, it's really easy. Mono Life Food Supper Shares, but um, but it's it's basically plant-based diet, a lot of legumes greens. I do have smoothies every day. I do drink java every day, but I make sure that I infuse with medicinal mushrooms so that it's uh, counteracting the adrenal uh, fatigue. Um, so yeah, pretty much plant-based. I do eat uh, honey and bee pollen because my focus on nutrition is about nutrient density. And those are two foods which are extremely nutrient dense. So I do incorporate it into my recipes and I do recommend it for all my coaching clients. So. I attest to everything she just said because she is now my nutritional coach and she's the one that made me even consider going plant-based because she makes freaking arepas with chimichurri on top and I was like okay that that's got me um yeah 100 percent Hispanic um so yeah she's been teaching me a lot about uh plant nutrition and you know we're just really good friends so, so she's not pushy which I really love because you know you always have like that one vegan friend that like doesn't eat anywhere and you're like okay that's awkward if you're <laughs> vegan you know what's up um so that was always like a fear for me is like I just want to be social and you know so much of our culture is sharing around the table right you sit down with people you enjoy you eat and and that's just such a big part for me and every time that I want to hang out with somebody I'm like hey girl you, you want to go get dinner so that's a really big part of my life um, but I've definitely been understanding the value of what we put into our body and I've always treated my body uh, like a temple, but I, I've really been understanding the value of what nature offers us. Um, I'm not fully plant-based right now. I do mostly pescatarian-esque, you know, something like that. Uh, but I, I enjoy food greatly, and I think imp the most important thing for me is feeling peace around what I put in my body and understanding that it is a blessing and a provision that many don't have the privilege of having every day. So that's my eating habit. 
Um, and then for me, I like to start my day off with a green smoothie, but I'm definitely not perfect. Like waffles sneak their way in every once in a while. And my philosophy with food right now is just to do better and like make better decisions and not beat myself up when, when you know, I crave, when I like crave a Cheeto or something. I she's <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I got a little Beautiful. baby growing in here. So now I'm a little bit more mindful, but the cravings throughout the pregnancy have been crazy. Well, actually it's the, the baby girl the who wants versions. a Cheeto. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she loves the salty stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> like things that I hadn't eaten in years and like overwhelmingly craving. <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, as far as like being plant-based, I, I eat largely plant, plant-based diet, but I'm just trying to do better. I, f I surround myself with a lot of vegetarians and I was feeling a lot of pressure to be vegetarian, you know, and I would love to be, but but I started realizing I can always do better. I can always cut down to less. And then when I do we need to, to make smart decisions and informed decisions about where that's coming from and how sustainable it can be, you know, and just, just trying to do better. And I think if we all do a little better, that makes a huge impact, a bigger impact than, you know, a couple of people becoming full vegetarian. If we all do a little better, that, that goes a long way. I don't, I d just well, one. Yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about. <laughs> Flexitarian is really, if I can put it in one word, yeah. and it's really being flexible for what your body needs on a day-to-day -day basis. After struggling with an eating disorder for 18 years, I got really good at saying, this is good, this is bad. This is fat, this is, you know, skinny. Uh, I got really good at playing opposites. So it took a long time for me to learn what the gray zones are and to start to eat based on the gray zones. And how I started to develop that, like you all have shared, it's really, it's, it's being in tune with your own self to say, how does this feel? So if I'm eating this meal, how do I feel afterwards from it? What is this food providing for me as a source, as a fuel? Um, and it's a lot of self-awareness to learn how something affects you, your energy level. Um, are you getting out, the same with the meditation, it's like, are you getting out what you want to? Because at the end of the day, the food is fuel. So that's what started to intrigue me about nutrition is learning how food affects my body. I'm always, I'm like the five-year-old kid who just never wanted to grow up and saying, well, why? 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 So I always want to know with food too, I'm like, well, why? So that got me really curious about food and that's how I eat today. So I say flexitarian because there's going to be times we were traveling through Spain and I was like, hell yeah, I want a piece of fish because I see exactly where that's coming from. Majority of the time here in the United States, because I don't really like a lot of our FDA regulations here. I'm pretty much vegan, plant-based most of the time. But I say most of the time because I have a really hard time putting myself into one silo because I did that for way too damn long in my life. Yeah. So, I always say practice discernment, right? There's all this information coming towards us, like do this, do that. And I think we all have to take it with a grain of salt and try it out. If that works for you, then go for it. If not, then you know, don't beat yourself up. I think there's just too many labels going on where I have to be this and that. I always tell people, and I tell a lot of my coaching clients, you know, practice discernment. I'm teaching you these tools, but it's up to you to apply and see if it really works for you. Same thing with meditation. You know, like be your own healer, be your own guru, like do all of that. Don't like idolize someone and think that their whole word is like everything, you know, so practice discernment. What are some of your, um, so we talked about food and how about in terms of things you ingest with energy, because that's really huge. I'm a big believer in energy. Um, share with us maybe like if there's instances of toxic relationships that you've had to cut off, or what do you do to really protect your energy? <laughs> I, I think in, intention is first, right? I mean, we can use sage and all of these holistic and new era things, and they're all great, and I applaud them, and I do include them. But I think that for, it's like, you know, when you go read the tarot or something like that, this is all great. But first of all, is our own, power, as, as you say, the guru in you, right? Your intention and your energy and making sure that you're surrounding self in that light of protection. If you know you're going to, I mean, I come across a, a lot of people in contact every day all the time. So it takes a lot of my energy because it's, it's normal. Not only is it demanding, but people are asking you things all the time. So a really good practice that I do on a daily is when I get home from work, I actually grab 
uh, sea salt and I put them in hot water and after my shower and during my shower I cleanse because salt is extremely cleansing removing negative energy so I don't have to only go to the ocean I can do it every night at home because every night I'm in contact with all of these people doesn't mean these people are bad or they're good or I'm not putting a definition but it's just that all of their energies are tapping into yours right we're just energy fields we're all tapping into each other um, and another thing that I do for energy, I do use, of course, I, I know there's sage in Palo Santo. For some reason, I like Palo Santo more. It, I think it's because it's from Latin America, um, <laughs> which is really, really incredible. But another thing is because I go to uh, Tulum all the time, I make sure to buy uh, copal and frankincense copal. and myrrh. So I do cleanse my home, not only with sage and not only with Palo Santo, but I do what the natives do there, which is a the bowl and I fill it and I cleanse the entire home with this. And I think a lot of it is, as you say, putting intention. You, you can be on a plane. The first thing I do when I get in an airplane, Sur you know, open the Reiki channel, surround that plane in white light, surround all the people there, including yourself, and you're already putting it out there in the universe. So a lot of it is not like just spending money and all this metaphysical tools. It just starts in here. If we want to add to that, that's fantastic. But that's the number way, number one way. And removing toxic relationships. It's like I always tell my clients, like, it doesn't matter how many green salads we eat every day. It doesn't man it matter how many smoothies. What matters is that if your mind and your heart are toxic free, your life is going to be toxic free. So it's a, it's a big thing because people are living in disease because I like to call it disease because there's an unease in your body which starts at an etheric level. We don't get sick physically unless something is going on at an etheric level. That is for sure. So because doctors don't tell us nowadays this, we have to discover. And that's where the work comes in, the spiritual work, the peeling the layers of the onion to be able to tap inside and really see where do I need to heal? Because we're all here to heal. So anyway. I think for me, um, it's two things really. The first one is grace. And the second one is resilience. So I think whenever I'm around other people, um, naturally everybody has like a different energy. And a lot of that energy is sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious. Um, but I think when I understand the concept of grace and if the energy is negative per se, um, it allows me to, to look at that person with compassion and understand maybe that's just that day. Really, maybe it's not that person, or maybe it's not something that I necessarily need to carry. And it also allows me to live in a freedom where I know that if I'm having a terrible day, a terrible week, or I just show up you know, in a way that's not representative of me one day, I really hope that that person would have the same grace with me and that they would extend that grace to me. So what that does is it allows me to live in a freedom. I'm not consistently like fearing other people's energy. I'm not worried about it. I'm also not living in the fear of like people wronging me. And I think that there's something really liberating about that because that wasn't always my natural, um, I guess like my default mode. And so being able to live in this freedom of understanding that I'm showing up in the world in the way that really serves others. And if I can understand that, having grace with others is my number one responsibility. That makes it all okay. And then the second thing is resilience. So it's really, for me, that was actually one of the words for 2019 that I wanna share with all of you guys and hope that maybe you take it into 2019 as well. The reason I find resilience to be my favorite word right now is because as a culture, we tend to duck and dive difficulty so desperately. So much of what we wanna do is like, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna avoid, you know, I wanna avoid that. I don't wanna make the same mistake again. And there's so much fear around everything that we do or choose to not do. And so for me, the empowerment in being able to live and live freely is to understand that I don't wanna work the muscle of perfection, I wanna work the muscle of resilience. Because I know that no matter how much I duck and dive the difficulties, they're gonna come my way. And the more resilient I am, the faster I'm gonna bounce back. So to me, resilience is probably my number one factor. I mean, I completely agree with, with the resilience part of that, and that's something I've been connecting with over the last couple of years. I started realizing that, that a lot of discomfort was coming from confrontation. Like, I think when, when I'm with pe difficult people and in confrontational situations, I tend to blame myself for, for that, for that like, event, and trying to figure out what happened, what went wrong, and that I have to repair this relationship. And, and I'll, I think it, it was an important moment when I realized it's okay to let go of these relationships and it's okay to let go of these expectations that every that you should always ha have a perfect little relationship with everybody and everyone should like you like it's okay to release that and for me that I think that's something important that that it's 
people move around in your life. So if you're in a toxic relationship with somebody, it's okay to cut that off. And not in a hateful way, in a loving way, and just like letting it go. I agree 100%, and I think the term that I use, how many have heard of energy vampires? <laughs> so we're all, we're fairly familiar, I see a lot of head nods and not a lot of arm raising, but that's okay, it's the nighttime. There we go, we got big arms up in the back. <laughs> I think we can all peg a person in our life, maybe they're not immediate family, maybe they are, that are energy vampires. Those are the people that I always try and limit within my life, because time is energy, is currency. And even though we focus a lot on money, time is the one thing that you cannot buy back, no matter how much money you have. So valuing that energy that you have and really holding on to it and saying, I come from a business background. So I always think of what am I investing in a business perspective. So if I'm spending this time, like this is time beautifully spent. The return on investment, connecting and sharing, this is amazing. But I can also spend an hour with a person who just sucks me to the ground and I'm like, what the hell did I just get hit by a truck here? Like what happened? So there's certain people that you can't fully cut out but limit the time. That's the part that I try and limit and create boundaries with other people. The part that I do for myself is every day I move. Now, I know if I asked you all to stand up right now, I won't because you're, many of you are wearing nice heels and everything, but I would ask you to stretch. I would ask you to do like one simple stretch. And that would change a lot of your energy immediately because you're moving your body, flexing the muscles, breathing. Those are the two things that I make a priority in my day is value my own time with who I'm spending it around and move. And it doesn't have to be just yoga. It doesn't have to be, run. I do a lot of different things. I'm an athlete in every respect. So it's moving your body every day. That's something that draws energy in for you. And then also putting up your own space to say, I'm, I don't think I want to invest that much in you. I can invest five minutes and do a drive-by and hey, how are you? But then keep the rest for yourself. I think that's beautiful and so important to put boundaries and learn that it's okay to say no. I think as women, we feel bad for saying no. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings or we're like, oh, we feel like, oh, you say yes to things that you don't want to say yes to and then you feel resentment. And that resentment is such heavy energy. So might as well spare, you know, your energy, other people's energy by speaking your truth, you know. Um, Let's move to, you were talking about moving your body and movement and energy, you know, what exercises and what type of movement do you all do? I kind of I kind of gave you a sneak peek, but I mean, it, it depends every day. When I categorize movement, I think of moving my body, but it can also be traveling. You know, Sabra, I know you were mentioning how much you traveled as a, as a kid and growing up, and it really, it transforms you when you're traveling the places you go, the people you meet, the cultures you encounter. Even me moving from New England and yourself moving from, she moved from Utah to New York and I moved from Boston, Connecticut to Miami. So it's like you want to cross cultures. It's, it, it's big culture change and you learn a lot that way. But physically moving, it can be anything from weights. One day it can be doing uh, yoga, it can be cardio. I don't like to run, I really don't like to run, but sometimes it's a nice challenge. So things that are always physically challenging me and pushing my own limits are things that I get a little uh, energy source from. So it changes every single day. And for me, for a long time, it's been yoga. And it's been yoga because it's movement and breath. And it puts me in that meditative space in the present moment. But um, now with my current state with the little baby, she does love yoga, but I've, I've had to change a lot of my practice because I was doing a lot of hot yoga and now I'm listening to my body in a whole new way. And I'm really loving cardio as well like in, in finding these other venues because for so long I was, I was just doing yoga. And I think you gotta find whatever works for you and stick to it and sometimes it's not easy. You know, I was telling my husband this morning, I hated yoga when I started doing it. I was doing it because we were dating and he liked yoga. <laughs> I actually ha really hated it, but I knew that it was good for me. I knew that there was something behind that. So find what works for you and, and stick with that. Uh, that would be my advice. I think for me, it's Zumba and surfing. I mean, when I, when I was living in Hawaii, Zumba was like the most exotic thing. And I'm like, y'all don't know. Like, y'all ain't from Miami, clearly. Um, so, but Zumba was actually really cool. It wasn't like salsa-ish. It was like hip hop and twerking. And I was like, yeah, I'm down for that. So uh, a lot of Zumba, a lot of surfing. And um, 
Sorry to bring it back to what you just said, but when we're talking about boundaries, I feel like that's a really important point because establishing boundaries is what actually keeps solid and healthy relationships. And I feel like a lot of times just having that communication with people, because the thing is, it's, it's really important to, to keep the relationship, sometimes even with the difficult people that you need to be like, all right, I, I need to limit my time, right? But I think being very clear about what your expectation of that relationship is is best, even if they might not understand it in the moment. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do on the spot to have to tell somebody, hey, I need to limit my time. Or even in my case, I have a terrible relationship with social, with social media and with just technology as a whole. I am not a machine. I don't try to operate like one and I don't try to compete with them. But I live in a culture where it is so normal to be on your texting all the time, on your phone, on email, do all the things. And I cannot, like I, my, my mind, my body, they either do that or they produce great content every day or they engage with people, but it can't do both. So I've made it a very big point to communicate that with people and say, hey, I'm terrible at texting. I'm terrible at email. I check my email like once or twice a week. I hope that's okay. I know that's a sin in this culture, but I'm just letting you know. So it's really important to just establish those boundaries for yourself and establish those margins and other people will respect them if you just communicate that to them. And so this is my pro tip. Uh, random, but I think it applies to everybody because everybody has email. So you know when you go on vacation or you go somewhere, or even if you're getting away for a weekend, and we tend to not even enjoy our experience or be present because we're so worried and stressed out about what we have to come home to. We're like, oh my God, I don't even want to get home to all those emails. Like you're just freaking out about it. So I actually do an autoresponder now. I discovered this about two months ago. <laughs> where this autoresponder says, hi, lovely, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm out of town, and because I wanna be present, this email will automatically be deleted, so please email me after such and such date. Think about that for a second, right? So what that does is it allows you to be completely in the moment and not have to be really stressed out about what you actually have to come back home to. And I think establishing those boundaries with our technology use, with our relationships, with our loved ones, sometimes even the people closest to us is such an important factor in keeping healthy and wonderful relationships. So that was a really long, non-related answer. <laughs> Uh, I think at this moment, I'm, I, I think that being in nature, just because of all the negative ions that are out there, I've done it all. I love Sumba, but that's because I think that when we dance, we really get free. It's not a structured class, and it really allows our inner child to come out. When we dance, there's, there's magic to dancing. Um, and uh, bike rides, like we live in Miami, the Venetian. I'm like, what is this dream place I'm living in? I'm looking at all this beauty. And so I think very much just earthing, walking in the sun, and grounding in nature because you know, doing the weight things and all that. It just becomes so routine, you get tired of it. And, and right now that's my jam. That's beautiful. And speaking about, you, you were talking about setting boundaries. I think that's a huge part of self-love and we'll segue into self-love. Um, a lot of people think self-love is, you know, you go shopping or you have spas or whatever. And that's great on that level. But if you want deeper sense of self-love, um, setting boundaries and saying no is a huge thing. Uh, that's something I teach my clients. It's something I, I practice for myself because, you know, getting over trauma, I had to relearn how to love myself. So what are some of the ways that you practice self-love? I mean, I, I practice self-love through gratitude, I think, I think that's always where it starts for me. So to be grateful for my life, my body, my family, my friends, uh, you know, my business, like the, the opportunities that come my way. And from there, I think, stems the sense of love. And then, and then there are also things that I do for myself, you know, like take a long bath and cut time out of your day to like read a nice book. But for me, it, it always stems from a place of gratitude, and, and that always blossoms into self-love. It's starting to smell really good over here. Yes. I'm going to start with that first. But Gratitude is key. Gratitude is key. And waking up every morning and thinking what I have, what I'm grateful for. I look out my window, and I'm like, damn, it's a beautiful day. So gratitude starts everything and coming from abundance, that thriving lifestyle that you were talking about in the beginning. Um, and the other part, uh, to fuel and show myself love is to give myself spaces in the day uh, to take time, take little breaks, take little pauses, be it to learn something. So every day I need to learn something. I need to fuel my own creative process and learning something, be it from a podcast, be it from uh, watching a how-to, be it creating something, taking a camera out and just filming something. To me, that fuels me. 
uh, and taking time out for the relationships that that matter, that you, you that are going to fuel you. So it, it goes back to one of our previous questions. Part of self-love for me, I know it's going to fill me up. So it's making time for that. Uh, for my husband and I to have time together, for, you know, making great meals that are going to leave me nourished. Those are little bits of self-love. And the parts that I get back from people that self-love, the content that I share, what I get back from them, the little messages that say, this inspired me for X in my day to change. It's like, oh, that to me is the best form of fuel. It doesn't cost anything, nothing. But it, it gives the best form of love and receiving at the same time. So all of those together. For me, the process of self-love wasn't necessarily a active thing. It wasn't a proactive thing. I think it was more of a passive result of that intimacy and sort of that time of solitude. And it was understanding that I was already loved. And so when I understood that I was already loved by this tremendously amazing God that was obsessed with me, I was able to love myself. I was able to understand I'm valuable. I was able to understand I have a reason. There's there's a purpose. And I know that word is heavy and carries a lot of connotations nowadays. But just even, even if I didn't understand what that purpose was, it was knowing that I had one and that that was enough of a reason to live and to take care of myself and my temple, which is my mind, my heart, my spirit, and my body. So that was a really huge part of me understanding where to even start with self-love. Um, and then I think as I was walking on that journey, it was also understanding what my trigger points were. So after going through a divorce, and by the way, I'm remarried and my husband's delicious, so just, <laughs> if you're divorced or you've gone through something like that and Marianne's story, then you know what's up. Um, so, it, it, you know, there was something really interesting about walking through that journey of loving myself and understanding myself that understanding my trigger points in terms of my pain. What are times of the day when I'm going to feel most emotional? I mean, I literally get emo right after lunch and I get tired. Maybe that's also because I'm Hispanic and I need a siesta. But at the same time, like, I know that there are certain parts of the day where I'm not going to schedule something important or something that's kind of like a heavy lift creatively or spiritually. So understanding those trigger points, understanding what times of the month I was going to feel really emotional um, and just working with that. And that's actually something that I would share with a lot of my girlfriends and now I do with a lot of clients and people that I get to work with, which is really understanding what your pain points are. When you're able to identify those pain points and really being very realistic with them, being realistic with yourself because that doesn't make you any less valuable, it doesn't make you weak, it just makes you wise, knowing and understanding those. And then being able to create support systems for that. So if I knew, especially while I was going through my divorce and I knew that I was gonna, I probably spent about a good two months where every single day after coming home from work, I would just get on my knees and cry. I would cry for about an hour. And I knew that that was gonna be part of my healing journey, part of that healing process. But I also knew that I had a plan and a collaborative system. And so part of that was saying, what are some things that make me come alive? And so I actually wrote down a list. I know this sounds really ridiculous, but I do a lot of child, childish ridiculous things. Not um, at all. <laughs> I, I love lists. Lists and journaling, it's like totally. It's, so, it's, yeah. I mean, we're literally children inside that just have adulting bodies. So a really big part of that was writing down a list and saying, what are some things that make me come alive? Well, I know, for example, um, emotional music makes me feel down. So I I want exciting music. I want upbeat music. I want Brazilian jazz. Um, I like certain, I like incense. Incense makes me feel warm. So I would put that on my list. I like painting. So I would literally write these lists of things that made me come alive and made me feel joyful. And at the time when I was feeling emotional or depressed or, or just even low energy, I would resort to that list. And so that's a practice that really kind of helped me in that personal journey of love, but also even to, still today supports my emotional or lower energy type days. So one of the reasons I, I wanted to put this event together was that I felt that there wasn't an intersection of wellness and conscious business and entrepreneurship. We either have wellness, meditation, yoga events, or we have entrepreneurial like business professional events, but there really wasn't a marriage of the two. Um, not that I knew a lot about here in Miami. And so I really wanted to talk about that because I feel uh, there is a correlation with 
spirituality, wellness, but also being abundant and money. And I think that that's something that uh, a lot of women also struggle with. You know, you think if you're spiritual, you can't make a lot of money, you know. So share with us a little bit about your conscious business and how you're able to balance wellness, spirituality with doing something that makes you money, but is also purposeful. When I was teaching yoga, like a couple years back, and I, at the time, I think I did up to maybe like 16 classes a week. This shit drains you. It's really tiring. Like, it's, it's fulfilling in some way, but it, it can really drain you. So I started to get smarter. And I was like, how can I do less? Because this isn't working for me. But still make equal or more. So I started to take on private clients. And I started to take on doing uh, corporate classes. So I changed the number of classes that I was doing for greater income. I started teaching on Fisher Island, too. So the other part is knowing your worth. Knowing what you can do and then knowing your worth. And be okay asking for it. Really, I would rather have somebody walk away from me when they would ask me, well, what, what do you charge for a private? And I would tell them, 125 for an hour. And I would drive to your house and I'll bring everything and I will do it. And there were some people who would say, great, let's do it this time. See you Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. See you then. Other people would say, that's too much. I'd say, okay, not for you. So it's knowing, that, knowing what your worth is. And I'm being very honest with the numbers. That's what I used to ask. Know what your worth is, be okay with asking for it. And then be confident after asking for it too. Because there comes a point of self-doubt that we start to wonder, did I price too high? Do I, did I miss out? And it's just, just go with, that's your gut talking, so go with it. Um, but also value the time that you're, try and get smarter with the time that you're spending. You don't have to do more to make more. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with what you're saying and having a healthy relationship with, with money. And, and you should be able to ask your worth and receive that. And we're, something that we were struggling with for a while with Reset is we didn't feel comfortable raising the price of our class. It's a $10 community yoga class. And, and we did that on purpose so that it, people could come and it would be accessible to everybody and be in an introductory level, level for people. So what we did was find out what are other things that we can offer our community. And we started, now we're doing two events a month, one the community Reset and then the other is a special event which is always like a higher price. And, and actually we're creating um, an innovative yoga product that's coming out in January. So I think that we wanted so badly to keep that community opportunity open led to these other avenues of income for us personally. I had a lot of shame around money. Um, I grew up with a mom that is incredible and was professional. She, she was a dentist, but because she liked to serve people and Sarah, you know, what's up? I see you. And our moms used to work together. Um, but it was really interesting because there was so much shame around charging. She's like, how am I going to charge somebody because their tooth hurts? She's like, that's a human necessity. You don't not pull out their tooth because they can't pay. And so I, I grew up with this idea that serving meant not being compensated. And, um, the, the fact is, she, she did get compensated, but she was probably the poorest dentist I knew. I mean, you know, all her friends were wealthy, and I was like, how come they have that stuff? She's like, we don't care about that. So, so there was always just like this, this taboo and sort of shame thing around money, even though I, I grew up in, a, in an environment that, while not wealthy at all, I would see all this stuff and kind of always look over the fence and feel like, I don't think we'll ever have that. So the, the shame and understanding that service and bettering other people's lives was not equivalent to having money or it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it was actually frowned upon, really stuck with me for many years. So I had a very terrible money mindset. Um, and even when I set out to do Dysfunction Magazine, I was like, well, maybe this will just be my passion project forever. So after I started the journey of, you know, embarking in the magazine as a whole, there was a point where I got really freaking tired and I was like, I'm, I'm doing over I don't know how many hours and having another full-time job and then you know being finishing school like I was doing so many different things at the same time and was like this is absolutely crazy so then I started understanding the value of being compensated for the thing that I love and but it was it was a very slow journey of having to have a different relationship with the money but I'm not going to say it was an easy one because it absolutely didn't make sense to me and no matter how much I tried to tell myself that that had to change it wasn't something natural to me so I started to feel this awful, intense pressure around my creativity and around the thing that I had to do. And I was like, I was called to do this thing, but I still need to eat. 
Um, so in that journey, I almost became obsessed with making money. And, and then I started to resent my craft. I started to resent my purpose. I started to resent this movement that once made me come alive and made me feel like this was the reason I was born. So in that process, I once again had to resort to this sort of intimacy, this spiritual time, this like knee, knee bending moment of saying, what am I supposed to do about this relationship with money? And I'll never forget, like my little crazy moments again, it was almost like God's voice saying, until you're not okay with releasing that and not making a cent, this is not gonna go anywhere. And I was like, okay. So I had to understand that what I put out into the world could not be contingent on the results. I had to understand that my heart had to be set on this thing and understanding that this was not equal to money. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to make our cash, but here's the thing. It was a mindset thing and it was a heart thing. When I understood that my heart towards the thing had to remain pure, I was now able to step into a place of understanding what the value of money was. And so in that journey, I started to understand, okay, I do need to pay the bills, but I don't care. Like if I need to find another source to, to make ends meet or to pay my bills, I cannot put the pressure emotionally on this thing to make it be my support system. Now there's two different types of people. There's people that need to take the complete plunge and jump off the cliff and be like, I don't even know what the hell I'm gonna do. And actually that propels them to do the thing. And there's other people that need the financial security to do the thing so that the pre there isn't that pressure on the thing that you're doing. So I think there has to be a, like a, a dual respect there for how you operate and what, what triggers you, whether it's the pressure or whether it's the peace. So for me, it was definitely the peace. And so I took that route. However, once I started to understand that money was just a source of income and that it could be through anything that I did, I started building in that spiritual relationship and understanding that what was mine already had my name on it. And so that led me to a place of not having to hustle for everything. That led me to a place where I was able to understand my worth even though I didn't know what that number was. And so everything that I started to produce, when I would charge for something, whether it was for an advertisement, whether it was for a coaching session, whatever it was, it wasn't contingent on what was in the market, it was based on what I needed to live or what I needed to meet my goals. And so therefore I wasn't afraid if I didn't get the deal, I wasn't afraid if I didn't get the advertiser. It really came down to me understanding if it's mine, all I have to do is show up. And so it, it really stemmed from a place of freedom and lack of fear. So, so I think that something that came up for me this week um, and this whole money and all this thing is that there's two things. One is money and one is achievement. And they're very different because we can have, and most of us now that people are tapping into wellness and, you know, how, what, what are my passions? Now so many people are finding what their passions. You might be a lawyer or a banker, but your passion is something else. So you go after that and you get great achievement, but maybe that achievement doesn't lead to financial success. And that's okay too, because that energy and that time that you've invested in your project or your passion or whatever it is that you're doing has value because it's allowed you to build to where you are today and what you're going to create in the future. So energy and money, it's just, an ex it's just another form of energy, right? Just like everything is energy. But I think that there has to be a clear line because a lot of, of the times we're like, but the money's not there, but how about all the other achievement? You know, how about all the other people that you might have touched? How about those, you know, the grain of sand that you left in somebody's mind? Is that more rewarding? And the reason I say that is because my mother's a psychologist and my father did international development. My whole life I grew up in third world countries. I was born in Africa. So we lived around poverty, always. Doesn't mean we were in poverty, but I understand what it is to live in a dirt house and to not. And when you see that and you see the reality of what people are living, you have find another respect for money because it's not about attachment. It's about I need it because I, it's gonna give me freedom, number one, it will give me, and it will help me help others because that's all I saw that my family did. The money, anything that, everything they were doing was mission driven. And that's why when I opened Mana, Mana for me, I'm not a restaurateur, I've never been one. I don't know anything about the restaurant business, but Mana for me is a project of wellness via food. So I think that that's really important to understand because my mission was not like, oh, I wanna become a millionaire. Or, no, my mission is always a social mission. So that's what I mean about personal fulfillment and achievement. And maybe Mana oh, it closes tomorrow or in 10 years, and I don't know. And maybe I become a millionaire, maybe don't. But I know that what I set myself out to do was to change people's lives. Everybody that came into Mana or that comes into Mana, I want them to leave with something. And as I say, it's not about converting, but it's about that self, 
that, that, that achievement of knowing that what I did or what I've created is to help transform people's lives. So think about that when you're thinking about money and you're thinking about your success and your personal achievements and how you're balancing all of those things out. I really think it's a, it's a, it's a mindset, you know, uh, and money is energy. And for me, it was reframing um, when people say, I want to be a millionaire. When I say it, I want to impact a million people. And when you impact that many people, money is just an energy that, that's a, a byproduct of it, you know. So it, it's the impact, it's the mission, and that energy will flow. Uh, so with wellness, um, I want to be mindful of time to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, one of the things that I always thought when I, when I saw people posting about wellness, it's always like, stay positive, do all this, do all that. And I felt a lot of it didn't talk about facing your shadows, right? We, it felt like it's, we still had to be this picture perfect wellness influencer and there wasn't many people who talked about, who really kept it real, which is what I, I love about this group. It's when we face our shadows, it actually helps us uncover our own light. So can you share a time where you had a, uh, an experience where you faced your own shadow and that actually made you stronger and made you um, step into your light more. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think my shadow for me was always feeling, I, mean, I was raised to be very um, proud, you know, like I, like I, I don't know the way I was raised. I, I interpreted it as like pride was like a bad thing, and I took that into like thinking that I, maybe I didn't have something to say, and and like put a lot of fear into me when it came to things like public speaking or coming saying something with authority. So every time that that I taught a yoga that I teach a yoga class, every time that I speak in public, that to me is like confronting those shadows and coming out and, and like, you know, you face your fears head on. That's exactly what you're doing right now. <laughs> For myself, because it was a lot of driven, it was really driven by uh, low self-esteem and, and self-image disorder. So you walk into a gym and I noticed especially a, a lot of here in Miami more than in Boston where I was before, you walk into a gym and one of the first things you see is a mirror. And so you see a reflection. In the past, for me, it was always seeing that reflection and saying, mm-hmm, yep, that, there, that, I'm going to focus on this today. Yeah, I don't think, no, I'm not going to eat after this. And now it's seeing myself in the mirror, and instead of seeing parts of my body that I want to fix, it's like, you're looking strong, girl. Like, you, you know, I see the smile on my face, the two way that my mood changes before and after a workout. So it's facing the shadow every day when I wake up, when I go to, when I see myself in the mirror and liking the person that I see now and putting those positive thoughts in my mind in saying it again the day after and the day after because it's the repetitiveness that starts to really ingrain it in your mind that creates a different mindset. Ah, I think for me, coming from a divorce and like I mentioned, never having a father around and really having a lot of identity issues. Facing my shadows meant putting this stuff on social media, which as crazy as that sounds, everybody who knows me in my intimate circle knows my stuff, you know, like I'm, I'm very open sharing that. Um, but then when I started to enter a more public sphere and having social media or using these avenues to for my business or for these different things, the thing that I set out to do was to create a reality for women and say like, this is what's really going on. This is who we really are. This is what our bodies really look like. This is what clothes really looks like on, on us. And I found that facing my shadows meant falling right into the trap of the exact thing that I set out to do. And so when I was, you know, when Instagram started and the whole thing, like I, I always loved wearing wild, colorful things like this. And then there came a point where I started to feel shameful about that because everything was so like neutrals and blacks and, and that was chic and that's what you do. And, and then also even feeling like, but I'm not a model. Like, who am I to go on there? Or who am I to show up? I don't look like that. And, and so facing my shadows was so much around the identity crises of who I thought I was and then who I was actually portraying myself to be on this platform. And so because I couldn't make myself something that I wasn't, I wouldn't. So I just wouldn't put it out there. And so facing my shadows meant 
facing the insecurities and facing the potential scrutiny. And it meant doing the thing regardless of the results. And so this, this particular mantra is doing things in spite of the results has been carrying out in different parts of my life, whether it was on, on the money perspective, whether it was in the social media perspective and the showing up perspective. So facing my shadows has literally come to the point where I love lists. So one time when I was on a, on a flight back home, I wrote an entire list of all the things that made me uniquely me but just because I'm weird like that. So I was like, I'm not gonna try to be funny about this and I'm not gonna try to be that. Like, what are things that are authentic to me? And I was like, well, I'm a grown ass woman that loves baby food. Okay, I wrote that down on the list. I love Lenny Kravitz. I shave my legs like once every three months. I just don't grow a lot of hair, but I haven't shaved. Um, so I just like started to write these things down and was like, this is me. Like, this is the you get that my friends know. This is the one who, who dresses wild and who doesn't care whether this fits right or not, but just feels happy in it. And so the, for me, it was really understanding that putting that, that side of me out was the scariest freaking thing that I could do, but it ended up being the most rewarding thing I could do. So it was sharing openly about my divorce and being in an abusive relationship. It was saying that I didn't care whether people didn't think that looked good on me or not because I felt good in it. It meant showing really beautiful pictures of accessories with very chipped nails when everybody else on Instagram had perfectly manicured nails. And so for me, it was literally just showing up the same way on the digital platform and the same way on a professional platform as it did in real life. I think the most, the thing I can most uh, relate this to is to my business. And the reason why is because I fought myself for a very long time to open a restaurant because I'm not a restaurateur, as I said. I, I had no idea of anything in the food business. I'm like, who am I to open this project? What the hell do I know about restaurant? I had just moved to Miami. I knew I was moving here to open up a project. I didn't know it was going to unfold into that. So I had a lot of back and forth with myself. And I just asked for a lot of guidance, like very specific messages from the universe. And the universe kept on giving me this. I was like, I would ask and boom, right there. And I'm like, okay, you're telling me to go that way. And then again, I would ask and then again. And it's like, you know, we keep on saying like, oh, I never get what I want. But, you know, if we ask and the universe is telling us and showing us these signals and we don't pay attention, it's like we're, we're closing the door on the universe, right? We're shooting ourselves in the own foot. So I'm like, if I keep, and, what, and I never forget where it was like super clear. My parents were living in Cambodia. And something had happened where I had seen a lotus flower. And the lotus flower is the symbol of birth and, and enlightenment. And it's a very powerful symbol. And for some reason, I was like, you know, if I'm meant to do this or if this is meant to be, and I know that this is where I need to invest my time, my money, my energy, like so many things. And it wasn't about the fear of doing it. I knew I could accomplish the project, clearly. It was just so foreign from what I had, what I've done, right, my previous. And it was like, just show me a lotus flower, like some way, however, wherever. And I swear to you that that afternoon I got a postcard from my mom from Cambodia and it was a man in the waters with a lotus flower. And I was like, okay, that's it. Like, I can't fight it. There's no way. I understand that I don't know the restaurant business, but I understand that also my calling and my, my, my mission is greater than if I know a restaurant business or no. Like, how that was going to unfold... Uh, I was going to figure it out, but it was a very clear, clear guidance that this is what I needed to do, even though my shadow and my fear was telling me, like, you're out of your fucking mind. If anybody has been in a food business, it's not easy at all. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have friends and all of that. And not only that, I was new to my aunt. I mean, I didn't know anybody here. I, like, I arrived, and the first thing I did was started to work. I didn't come to parties, so it was, like, a total different uh, experience for me. So that was a, a very big... Um, you know, a, a very doubt, doubting time in my life about how I wanted to create a project here in this city. And I just realized that there were so many people that didn't have somewhere to go eat. And more important, that didn't know what they were putting in their body. Because the thing is, food has a spiritual energy to it. So it's not if I'm vegan, if I'm paleo, if I'm, you know, all of these titles and things. and flex, it, it, it goes even beyond that. It's about Food has messages in it, has a spiritual energy. So when we think about, you said something and I didn't respond, which is about like that self-love. Self-love is knowing and learning and really educating yourself on how to nourish yourself. All right. So um, before we head to the raffle, can you just share how they can keep in touch with you? If they want to work with you, ask any questions, all of that. Share kind of how they can keep in touch. Live Free Warrior. And it's really that across every single platform. My website, Instagram, I'm launching a book December 1st, uh, which is all about uh, my autobiography, but also 52 tips that you can implement into your life for living a life 
of Cancer Free. So across every platform, YouTube, Instagram, and my website, Live Free Warrior. Yes. And I'm an Instagram girl, so my, my personal Instagram is Plantapanda, and then you can follow reset.mia for wellness tips and then for information on our future events. So I hope to see you soon. Um, so dysfunctionmagazine.com. Uh, the Instagram, I actually run the Instagram myself, so you can just DM me, send me anything in there, just dysfunctionmag. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be launching a, basically like an academy, so it's gonna be several different online courses. The first one I did it about Instagram, I just know a lot about it, but I'm not attached to the topic. But the next course that we're launching is about time management, soulful time management, and really understand, understanding the stewardship of time to get all the things done that you actually wanna do. Um, so yeah, if you just follow us on there, I'll be sharing all the goodness and all the good stuff on there. Um, Mana Life Food, if you haven't been, have you been to Mana Life Food? Oh, you need to go, for sure. Like five minutes from here, uh, Northeast 2nd Avenue. And uh, Saber Shares um, through all social media. And I'm also, from having 18 years of doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and really it being impossible to have so many people um, to be able to coach running the business and doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm also... Um, bringing out a new program where I'll be able to deliver it to a group of people in a much larger scale. So that's coming out in January. It's not a business related, it's wellness and health related. But if that's something that you wanna tap into later in the future, or if anybody's curious about anything plant-based or holistic wellness, then you can ask me anytime, I'm here for that. Um, I'm on Instagram at mbakaluba. Uh, really active on there. I have a podcast, Thriver Lifestyle Podcast, and a YouTube channel. Uh, and then I'm relaunching my Thriver Lifestyle course, and it really teaches uh, survivors to transform into thrivers in mind, body, and soul. So it helps you with a lot of mindset uh, rewiring um, and really how to thrive and live uh, your fullest as a thriver in life. <laughs>